Okay, caught some turtle football. Not turtle football. Not turtle football. You definitely don't play that. Tortoise tennis. No, I'm not doing any of that. Respect the tortoise. Take a cricket. Cherish the turtle. Um, <laughs> we, um, sorry we have to cut this a tiny bit short. It's an excellent piece of music, but we uh, have to get to the music news. Six music. Music news. Because it's uh, good one. Okay, so on the 12th of October, we're going to see the release of the latest in a series of career spanning David Bowie box sets. Now, these, we've been talking about that, these before. They've been five years, 69 to 73. Who can I be now? 74 to 76. A New Career in a New Town, 77 to 82, and this new one called Loving the Alien, 1983 to 1988. It's 11 CD, 15 vinyl set, uh, newly remastered versions of what's actually Bowie's most successful commercial period, starting off with Let's Dance, which really kind of propelled him into the commercial mainstream in a sort of stadium-filling way that he'd never been before. It's Follow Up Tonight, Never Let Me Down, the live album Glass Spider, live in Montreal, and the previously unreleased Serious Moonlight album, which is the Let's Dance Tour. Mm -hmm. um, plus, as with all these box sets in the past, sort of a collection of uh, remixes and non-album alternative versions of B-Side. Now, the accepted wisdom is that obviously Let's Dance is just a classic. Tonight's got its moment, loving the alien. But Never Let Me Down wasn't really Bowie's finest record. And the production, at least, the sound of the album, hasn't really aged that well. I don't know, it still sounds pretty good. But this album, this set this box set includes a reversioning of that whole record so in 2008 bowie asked the producer mario mcnulty to remix a track called time will crawl of this album and record new drums by sterling campbell who'd been his drummer for a long time along with new strings and in the notes for the record bowie remarked oh to redo the rest of the album which is what they've done mm. so mcnulty and sterling bassist tim lefebvre who played with black star and Reeves Cabrels and David Torn, the guitarists, uh, have recorded the whole album under Bowie's vocals. So this is kind of what Bowie wanted to happen. Mm. Uh, Reeves Cabrels played with Bowie from 88 to 1999. Uh, he was in Tim Machine, Bowie's kind mm -hmm. of pixies influenced rock band, and he's in The Cure. And our reporter Georgie Rogers spoke to Reeves yesterday to find out more about the album and his memories of David, and this is what happened. <laughs> Mario McNulty, who produced it, was, he and I were talking about it, we were kind of calling it a reproduction, but, <laughs> because, like, it's been reproduced, but not, like, in the normal sense of reproduction, <laughs> <laughs> and, because uh, uh, it's, it's far beyond a remix, since there, we really re-recorded and replayed just about everything except for David's vocals and guitars. Is it fair to say that Bowie kind of had the idea for this? Because there was some notes, wasn't there, on Time Will Crawl from around 2008, where he'd sort of said, redo the whole record. Well, he had worked with Mario on, on one track, and I think the addition of strings was an idea, and then it became, uh, it became a really good idea that Mario and David had talked about pursuing. So they discussed re-recording it. What David had done was left it's my understanding that David left a lot of little plans behind. I'm not sure if they're in sealed envelopes that get opened every year or what the story is, but, mm. but uh, he left a, a, basically an outline of what to do, and he requested that Mario produce it, and I believe there was a list of musicians that he wanted on it. <laughs> What can you say about Never Let Me Down and I suppose the context of, because this box set spans some of his biggest works, you know, mm -hmm. the Let's Dance era, those huge, huge Bowie hits. Mm -hmm. uh, I met David in 87 and then in 88 we started writing and, and he and I were recording some things together not knowing what it was going to be and one of the first conversations he and I had early on was sitting at the, we recorded at Mountain Studios in Montreux, Switzerland, and we were sitting in deck chairs <laughs> looking out at the lake trying to figure out, you know, what this thing that we were writing was becoming. And this is pre Tin Machine. We talked about uh, Never Let Me Down in particular and that he was thinking about even possibly re-recording some of those 
songs as soon as 1988, and I was against that because it was too close to when they had come out. He felt like he hadn't gotten the sound he was looking for, and it wasn't wasn't the musicians. Everybody played great on it. It was just he didn't feel like he participated enough in it, but the, the songs were good, so he wanted a redo. Uh, what do they call it in golf? A mulligan. <laughs> and uh, But he was also, uh, in terms of the box set, Let's Dance was, as he explained it to me when we were talking about all this, this he was pursuing an idea, a sound. They achieved it, it came out, and it was an, a big hit, and that wasn't expected. Like, they didn't go in and think they were writing a, a hit album. And then for the next two albums, you know, for Tonight and Never Let Me Down, it was sort of an albatross because expanded. He, David always felt like he lost the sense of who his audience was. Mm. And, well, because Let's Dance had just gone so big. Yeah, and he had never had that kind of success before. Mm. And, and I remember back, back in the 80s, it was... Tina Turner and Phil Collins, you know, were, I mean, David did a Pepsi commercial with Tina Turner, you know, and he felt like he had, he had fallen in with that audience, that audience had attached themselves to him, and they were not his audience necessarily, you know, people that couldn't see the difference between David's catalog and Tina Turner's catalog, so it was a very successful period for him, but it also was a pressurized period. He was trying to give the record company, uh, he said with the next two albums, he was trying to give them what they were paying him for. <laughs> because he renegotiated, you know, his contract changed after he sold seven million copies of, of Let's Dance. Yeah, I guess sort of following up that success and maybe a little bit of pressure on him yeah. to... And we kind of took care of all that with Tim Machine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think he'd be really pleased with the new sound of what you guys have done? I, I, I do think so. I mean, that was that was the nice thing about it was, you know, I've known Mario for a few years, and I always felt like in talking to him that he understood what David was looking for. So, yeah, I think we reached a, a timeless point with the recording. It doesn't sound like it was recorded in 1987, and it doesn't necessarily sound like it was recorded in 2018. It was funny because it, it sort of just felt like we were recording a, a record with David and he just hadn't come into the studio that day. The first song I worked on was Zeros, and I believe that's the first single. One of the things that we used to do all the time was David and I would often cut acoustic guitar, record the acoustic guitars facing each other and both of us playing at the same time. It gave it a little more of a natural feel. So we would record together. And I had my headphones on and I had my guitar that I was playing in my right ear and David was in the left ear and his vocal was in the center in the headphones. And I had my eyes closed while I was tracking. And in my mind's eye, I saw David sitting across from me and the way his body language was and the way his eyes would look while he was playing because he could get this sort of far away look but he was looking at you at the same time and uh, I recorded the pass of me playing acoustic guitar with David and when I stopped I opened my eyes and I expected to see David sitting there and that was sort of the I got that feeling out of the way early because I knew at some point it was going to you know I was going to either hear his vocal or or something was going to happen that would you know bring tears to my eyes while I was doing it and you know, that perhaps is my most recent David Bowie anecdote. In my mind, he was there. It's very emotional. Yeah. Thank you very much to Georgie for speaking to Reeves. Thank you very much to Reeves speaking to Georgie. He's, he's a, a, a legend in and of himself. Isn't Indeed. It, yeah. In fact, actually, we're going to hear from him uh, in a couple of weeks talking about The Cure, because as I say, he plays guitar with The Cure as well. They just did their big high park yeah. gig. And maybe some more stuff in the